the socioeconomics unit here at King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies in Riyadh. I'd like to welcome you to this joint King Faisal Center Atlantic Council event on religious education reform in Saudi Arabia. Here at the King Faisal Center, we are delighted to cooperate with our colleagues at the Atlantic Council's new Empower Middle East initiative. And very importantly, this initiative aims to raise awareness about positive developments in the region and provide a deeper understanding of success stories and how we can replicate these. And in fact, Stephanie Ali, the Deputy Director of Empower Middle East will moderate this event. We're also very pleased to welcome our speakers, Dr. Nadja Alotebi, the author of the King Faisal Center special report around which this event is based. And uh, the link to that report is in the invitation that you would have received. Fahad Nazar, who's the spokesperson at the Embassy of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in Washington, DC. And Dr. Fala Pandit, who's senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. So Stephanie, Najah, Fahad and Farah, many thanks for agreeing to join us and for your participation. Uh, before we just dis start the discussion, uh, I would like to remind everybody to please look out for future King Faisal Center and Atlantic Council events as advertised online, whether they be virtual or hopefully next year when we're able to start some in-person ones as well. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Stephanie for the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And let me just also remind everybody, please do type questions you may have into the Q&A box in your panel. I'll come to those later on in the discussion. I'm just gonna start with a few questions first to our panelists. So let me start first with Najah. So thank you for writing this wonderful report, really informative. Let's start off by looking at history and the big picture since religious education reform is of course tied to overall education reform efforts. Saudi Arabia's literacy rate was 79% in 2000, and then it went to 95% in 2017, and the government is pledging to reach 100% literacy by 2024. We're also now seeing more women graduating from college than men in Saudi Arabia. So Najah, can you give us a sense of Saudi Arabia's education landscape over the past few decades what major achievements have been made and what are the most significant problem areas still? Thank you so much, Tiffany. It's a real pleasure to be invited to speak in this uh, panel and about this important subject. Uh, to answer your question, um, I think education is a main priority for Saudi Arabia. Uh, the second largest governmental spending goes to education, way higher than any other sector. And for this reason, we have seen um, important results, like the examples you have just given us about, um, you know, how Saudi Arabia uh, broke down the illiteracy rate in a short time frame. Um, I was surprised actually uh, while I was doing the research to learn that uh, Saudi Arabia also had managed to uh, achieve gender parity in education only two decades after they have allowed women to go to school for the first time, which is very extraordinary. Um, however, if you look at um, the content and the quality of education, that's I think was a problematic in the past. And uh, it is a problem, it's an issue that both uh, Saudis and you know Saudi officials recognized that you know in the past the Saudi curriculum was unable to provide their youthful population with an appropriate knowledge and technical skills, um, which also aggregate, aggravated the, their efforts to find jobs for them. And I think the challenge that we used to have before was that the dominance of religious teaching um, over science. And um, I remember when I was uh, studying in Saudi Arabia, religious studies accounted more than um, two thirds of the total education. 
and that didn't leave any, um, uh, you know, uh, for students to have, you know, knowledge of uh, science, economics, and no critical thinking, and um, which complicated uh, the quality and the outcome of the education. Okay, thank you. And you touched a bit on what I was going to ask next, but um, let's let's zoom in more on this religious curriculum issue. So can you tell us a bit more about your personal experience with the religion classes in Saudi Arabia? How did it used to be, at least in your childhood? Uh, okay, my experience was, um, my education was very religious and very restrictive. Um, I remember in the classroom, we were not allowed to ask a challenging question. I remember we used to have libraries that was filled with uh, books about, um, you know, some, you know, radical thinkers talking about jihad and hijab and, you know, women's rule in society. Um, let me give you something further. I remember we used to have like a, a tennis court. Uh, at school, and um, I remember teachers uh, saw girls playing tennis, and they came to cut the nets because they thought uh, sport is for boys. And you can see here that what complicated the Saudi education was not just their curriculum, but also teachers. Yes. So in your report, you write that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's approach to reforming education differs from those of his predecessors in that their approach is focused entirely on the educational apparatus. But Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's focus has shown that he's prepared to work with institutions beyond the education apparatus, such as religious institutions. So can you tell us more about why you think this approach is novel and why you argue in your report that you think it's more likely to succeed? Um, well, I have examined uh, different approaches for different Saudi monarchs, and many of them had um, concerted efforts to modernize the education system, such as King Faisal and King Abdullah. Uh, but taking all their efforts and their programs together, we see that, you know, these efforts were conducted in a, in a random um, fashion. They were not united under a strategic vision that just like the, 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 the way we see it here under, under vision 2030. Um, they focused mainly when they reformed the education, they focused on the educational institutions, but not necessarily um, alongside with reform in other institutions or other aspects of policy. On the other hand, we see that um, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's reform is, is different. It's much more strategic um, in the way that um, he is reforming the education system, but also he showed that he's prepared to address with reform other institutions, such as the religious institutions. We have seen that uh, his educational re uh, uh, reform was also uh, done in a parallel with, with reforming the religious discourse, re uh, reforming the religious establishment. We have seen that he's trying to empower moderate Islamic clerics so they can influence the, um, how people in Saudi Arabia understand Islamic principles and, and notions. We have seen also that he, he was prepared to, you know, crack down on extremists and extreme uh, figures who for long hindered the education reform. For example, disbanding the um, religious, uh, religious police, for example, um, dismissing teachers who alleged to be promoting extremist ideas. Um, so I, I think by tackling the wider issue of the and the influence of the religious establishment over education, I think Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's approach is more likely to succeed. Okay, let me bring Farah now into the conversation. So 
A recent Time Magazine article stated that, quote, since the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, D.C., every administration that has occupied the White House has asked the Saudi government to revise what it teaches its children with only glacial change as a result. So far, my question to you is, would you agree that the change has been glacial? And what do you see as the stride Saudi Arabia has made? And what are the areas that concern you that still need to be addressed? Well, Stephanie, you know, one of the things that I think is very important to state outright is that uh, a country's internal education program is a country's internal education program. Um, and I, I want to state that because I think it is important. The reason why the United States began to look at the aspects of the education curriculum um, that were absolutely important for us was because of what happened on 9-11 in a more urgent way. We were trying to figure out how people get radicalized um, and what are the, you know, where are they getting their information? And of course that leads you back to textbooks, that leads you back to um, how they learn about identity and religion. Um, it takes you back to what they're learning in mosques. It takes you back to all of the touch points a young person has to learn about religion. And so one of the things that became very clear to us is is that we had to examine more carefully what was taking place uh, in in the Saudi textbooks, in the translations of the Qurans, in a whole host of things that we began to put on the table. Um, so I, I would 100% agree with the statement that it has been glacial. There are some great things that if one, I mean, uh, you know, Najah's report talks about the history of education in Saudi Arabia and from a lay person looking at this, it looks fantastic. Women can now be educated. Um, we are not just looking at religion being three quarters of all you learn every day. Um, you're not, you're, you're examining and re-examining the idea of analytical thinking so that it's not just rote learning. I mean, these are all positive steps, of course, but the concern that I have uh, is based directly on what I have seen come out of textbooks and the translations of the Qurans around the world, in including the training of imams that are, so this isn't, Stephanie, just about um, you know, the changes that are taking place within the kingdom on the ground in the schools. It's what has happened writ large around education reform and what that means for the rest of the world. Okay. And you worked in both the Bush and Obama administrations and as the United States' first ever special representative to Muslim communities, which entailed visiting almost 100 countries. So from what you saw when you worked in the government, how has the United States been addressing the religious education reform issue and the, some of the extremism pieces you talked about as well with Saudi Arabia? And then specifically, is the U.S. government taking the right approach on this issue? And what do you think the new administration of President-elect Joe Biden should be doing to advance it? Well, you know, we as the United States have looked, and let me be clear, I'm no longer in the government, so I'm saying this with a we of, as an American, um, but we address issues about education curriculums and human rights and, um, you know, respect for all faiths and religious freedom across the board in every country. It's not just Saudi Arabia. So our assessment of where they are along the way is compared to, um, to others. It's also us looking at what they can do better. But what I will say, and I have been very, very direct with, um, with a reflection on in going to nearly 100 countries, the only data point that was consistent for Saudi Arabia was the textbooks that they were sending around the world, the Qurans, the, the teaching um, of, of religion. Um, and this is based on a monolithic idea of what it is to be a Muslim. I am not here to be the religious police on how to be a Muslim, but I am here to say that it is important that the diversity of expression of Islam should be valued. And that is not taught in the religious textbook. It's, it, it is not taught in the way in which imams coming out of Saudi Arabia around the world are expressing themselves. And the direct correlation between that and the way a young person understands religion is that they believe that there is an us and them. They believe that there's only one way to be Muslim. Now, this is a much more complicated issue, Stephanie. This is not just about um, a, a Wahhabi mindset uh, around the world and trying to spread that perspective around the world. But it's the direct impact on the security for the United States and other countries who are watching young children 
um, learn from that one dimensional way of thinking um, and believe that that's the only way to be. Now, I want to be fair to the changes that have happened in Saudi Arabia. There have been um, uh, there have been changes in textbooks that are removing some of the hellish language that has demonstrated that you know all Muslims that don't do things in a particular way uh, should be should be killed. I mean, there is there's tweaks to language, there are tweaks to the issues around sorcery, there are tweaks to different things, but it isn't across the board. I mean, I think one of the things that is most problematic for me is that while I see the words on the page for the vision 2030 that MBS has put on the table, the actions are not just around throwing people in jail and saying, look, um, we've taken the bad clerics out, they're in jail and there hasn't been pushback. It is about how you perceive the importance of education. What is it all about? And what is your role in the world in what you believe um, about Islam? And do you either believe that it is okay to have a diversity of expression of Islam or not, one. And two, what are you saying about other faiths, Jews in particular, um, Christians? Um, are, you, are you buying into this, um, th this belief that in fact we can all live together or do you advocate through your religious teachings that there's only one way to eat, live, pray and demonstrate Islam and if you're not doing it, um, you know, you're not doing it right. And that, Stephanie, by the way, sorry, just to bring us back to the question that you asked, why is that important? Is because the, the flooding of the marketplace of ideas around being Muslim comes from one place and that's Saudi Arabia. So if Saudi doesn't buy into a more diverse expression of Islam, that's, that has been um, seen, and I have seen it firsthand, whether it is in a textbooks in, in Leicester, UK, or on the shelves in Kazakhstan, or in a you know, bookstore in Delhi. It's across the world. So I would say to you, the importance of the way Saudi Arabia takes this task seriously ma matters, not just inside of the kingdom, but globally. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that and get more specific even is, so, so what would it take to prove to nations yeah. that have criticized Saudi Arabia that the kingdom is serious about reform? Yeah, and I and I again want to say it is not it is Saudi Arabia in this in this moment in 2020 is not the Saudi Arabia on these issues from the 1980s. Absolutely, there has been a change, and I am grateful that we are seeing language change and um, and an attention and a focus to this issue in a different way. So it has to be said that that is taking place, but it's not it's not cohesive. It is. It, you know, the, the idea here that MBS is including education as part of a multi-sectoral thing, and that's why we need to go slow, or look at what we've done. We've put all of the education online, and so you can see what we're doing. You need a passcode to get in. If you're a scholar and you're trying to see what's in the textbooks, you can't access that easily. So one, make it available. Be transparent. If you're saying you're changing things, show us. Pick back up all of your textbooks, all of the translations of the Qurans, all of the things, that, the materials that you've spread around the world, over $2 billion have been spent globally on this. And three, really importantly, make it clear in actions and words that the diversity of Islam is important to you. Um, that that means that there is not this sense of there's only one way to be a Muslim and our way is the right way. Thank you for that. Let me bring Fahad into the conversation. So Fahad, uh, let's start with the big picture. Can you outline some of the education reform efforts that are going hand in hand with the religious curriculum reforms? How do those efforts fit in with Vision 2030 and what key performance indicators would determine success? What does success look like? Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. And I do want to thank the King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies and the Atlantic Council for organizing this important webinar about a subject that unfortunately doesn't quite get enough uh, attention, certainly not uh, in the West. So I think it's worth mentioning that prior to my appointment as the official spokesperson at the Saudi embassy here in Washington two years ago, I was affiliated with the two think tanks out, uh, here in Washington. I was also a columnist for a Saudi newspaper. And in that capacity, 
I spent several years writing about various developments, political, social, economics in the kingdom. Uh, one of the issues that I followed and wrote about very closely was education reform. In fact, in 2016, I was in attendance in Riyadh at a press conference when uh, back then the Minister of Education, uh, His Excellency Dr. Ahmed Al Isa, announced the launch of a training, of a new training program for teachers. This program entailed sending 900 teachers of both genders to various countries to, uh, for training and to have uh, firsthand experience with new teaching methods and methodologies. Um, this was the, the, uh, the minister himself spoke uh, very openly and very frankly about the need to improve the effectiveness of teachers and about the need to uh, understand and to gain uh, and to learn from some of the lessons from uh, various countries and to work and to partner with other countries and other institutions that have had success in this field. At the same time, um, also worth, worth mentioning is that back in 2018, I attended almost a week long uh, conference that was organized by the Ministry of Education also in Riyadh. This is an annual conference that they host every year. That year, the theme was the importance of early childhood education. Um, this conference brought literally hundreds of Saudi teachers from all over the country. Not only that, it actually included uh, teachers from the United States that year. The United States was the guest uh, of honor of the conference. And uh, again, it was a, a multi-day long conference where teachers spoke about some of the new reforms that are being implemented, some of the new technologies that are being incorporated, as well as some of the challenges that, uh, that they continue to face. Um, not only that, but I actually had a, an opportunity to attend a number of workshops uh, during those days with teachers, seeing some of the training that they're undergoing. Again, not just to deal with new teaching uh, methods, but also it became very clear to me that uh, the kingdom has really adopted a comprehensive approach to uh, education reform. So uh, not only were they discussing you know, te new teaching methods, but they're also looking at uh, you know, meeting the, the emotional needs of uh, children. Like I said, the theme was early education. This is uh, uh, an issue of much debate now across the world. So it really, to me, uh, brought home the fact that uh, there's an absolute sincere effort that extends all the way from our leadership, from uh, King Salman and His uh, Royal Highness Grand Prince Mohammed bin Salman, down to the uh, Minister of Education, to the administrators, and definitely uh, all across the board to, to uh, the thousands of teachers across the kingdom. Now, uh, ultimately, we believe that education is the key to unlocking the potential of our greatest asset, which is our human capital. We have a predominantly young population. We believe that education will enable us to become not just regional, but uh, hopefully global leaders uh, to harness the power of science and, and technology and to tr transform the kingdom and to lessen its dependence uh, on energy sector. So, you know, the ultimate objectives are, are clear. We want to uh, develop well-educated, well-informed, well-engaged uh, students who can not only compete with their peers uh, around the world, but who can also contribute to the development of the kingdom, but also contribute to the improvement of the human condition more broadly around the world. The objective is also to develop more effective teachers who see teaching not simply as a job or an occupation, but who see it as a well-rewarding career. And obviously we are well on our way towards establishing world-class state-of-the-art ed educational institutions as well. Now, having said all of this, I think it's very important to realize that uh, almost by definition, education reform, much like healthcare reform, is always a work in progress in the sense that you can always do better. So unless every single student is a straight A student, there's always work to do and you can always do better. So if we take that into account and if we take into account the fact that the science of both teaching and learning is ever evolving, and if we take into account also the fact that uh, technological tools have been introduced into the classroom that really have changed dramatically the way that teachers teach and students learn, uh, it makes sense that this process is uh, not just ongoing, but it would be a little slow because there's so much that we have to incorporate into, into what we're doing. But there's no 
doubt in my mind that uh, there's a, a commitment that comes all the way from the top. And Najah, I think, did a, a nice job in her report that shows all the various uh, dimensions and different efforts um, that we have put over many years. And because we really do believe that, uh, you know, it really all starts with education. So let's turn to the problematic content in the Saudi religious curriculum. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom stated in a 2020 report that while there has been, quote, progress in recent years, end quote, on addressing intolerant content in official textbooks, including for the year 2019 to 2020, there are still intolerant passages in the textbooks. And a 2018 study by the Anti-Defamation League of Curriculum for the 2018 to 2019 school year suggests the same thing that the Saudi Islamic syllabus is moving towards greater tolerance, yet some content to incite persists. So what steps is Saudi Arabia taking to address that remaining content that is quote likely to incite? And what timeline do you see for completion? Right, so the content of the textbooks has received a lot of, a lot of attention over the years. What I can say is that our education officials have long acknowledged that in the past, uh, there was some material that was deemed uh, objectionable, that was deemed uh, offensive. And we have made a very concerted effort to remove all of it from the entire curriculum. And not only that, but we have replaced this, this offensive material with lessons that promote moderation, toleration, and peaceful coexistence. The message that Saudi students here at their schools and here at their mosques, incidentally, is very consistent. It says that Islam is a religion of peace, moderation, toleration. We do absolutely embrace the fact that the Muslim community is diverse. We have done it in both deed and in, uh, in word. Um, we have supported a number of uh, institutions over the years that have in fact promoted interfaith dialogue and understanding. So um, just to, uh, to name a few, there is the, uh, the, the, the Global Center for Combating Extremist Ideology that uh, is com more commonly known as Atidal. This is a center that is based in Riyadh. We have supported the King Abdullah Interfaith Dialogue Center in Vienna, Austria. We were one of the founding members of this institution. We have also supported the UN Counterterrorism Center. We, in fact, um, gave it uh, $100 million in, in support back in, in 2016. We have supported another local institution inside Saudi Arabia known as the King Abdelaziz Center for National Dialogue. This is another institution that has promoted dialogue, uh, constructive dialogue and understanding and diversity of Saudi people inside Saudi Arabia in general. Just more recently, um, two, two weeks ago this year marks, uh, we are the president of the uh, G20. So we convened a five day interfaith forum uh, a virtual forum that again brought together leaders of a very wide spectrum of, of uh, people of faith to again to talk about the importance of, of uh, religion, to talk about the importance of interfaith dialogue and understanding, and to talk about how important and how religion plays an important uh, role in people's lives and how it can be a force for good in resolving many of the issues that we as an international community continue to host. Not only that, but a few years ago, we even convened what I think was a groundbreaking uh, uh, meeting of uh, religious, Muslim religious leaders representing every tradition and every denomination of Islam that ultimately at the end of that uh, meeting, they came up with what is known as the Mecca Charter that again, uh, stresses the importance of uh, diversity, of the diversity of the Muslim communities, stresses the importance of respecting uh, differences of, of opinions and diversity of um, uh, Muslims in general, and also peaceful coexistence with uh, with other with people of other uh, faiths. So, having said all that, I think um, what these reforms have begun to pay dividends in very real ways. And so, if if it's possible, Stephanie, I know that I've provided uh, your colleagues with a photo um, that I think uh, really speaks volumes about how the education reforms that we've begun implementing, that we implemented actually a number of years ago are paying dividends as we speak. So if you could please, uh, if it would be possible to uh, put up this picture for a second. So. We will get it up in just a second. Okay, no worries. So. 
Um, one of the ways that our education reform has begun to, to, pay, to pay dividends, as I said uh, at the outset, one of the objectives is to develop students who feel engaged and feel compassionate uh, not just inside the kingdom, but, but more broadly uh, around the world. So we have an estimated 200,000 students uh, studying in, in countries as different as the United States, the UK, Japan, India, China, Russia. Obviously, all of them are there to attain a formal education. But at the same time, many of them have taken the opportunity of being in these countries to give back to their local communities. So as we speak, since we're in the United States, um, I'll use the U.S. as an example. There's an estimated 40,000 Saudi students here as we speak. Uh, many of them have taken some time off from their studies or have in their time off from their studies have used the time to give back to their local communities. So they're volunteering their time at senior homes, at soup kitchens, at uh, schools, at hospitals. Some of them have even traveled across country to help various communities recover from natural disasters. The, pic the picture that I provided, I don't know if it's up on the screen or not, um, shows uh, a Saudi led, a Saudi student led organization known as Hand by Hand, where Saudi students were helping some of the communities that were hard hit by uh, Hurricane Harvey in, in the Houston area back in 2017. And I think that is a credit to what Saudi students are learning through their education, through their education institutions, as well as their mosques. Saudi students now believe that they have both a moral and a religious obligation to help their fellow mankind, regardless of their religious faith or their uh, national background. And the, the picture uh, that I provided shows a number of these students uh, working, um, doing some pretty hard work, re physically reconstructing and rebuilding a home in. Uh, in Houston, so I think this is credit. Uh, I think uh, to the uh, to the effort that we have put forward. Uh, but like I said, this is an ongoing process, and we will continue to uh, to invest time and money and effort towards um, you know making sure that our students are have every tool at their disposal to succeed both in the kingdom and to compete with their peers across the world. Well, I can say from personal experience with the, the Saudi students, I've been fortunate to call friends. I've been so touched by their generosity. So I can, I can definitely attest to that. So let me, let me actually take a question from the audience here that is aligned with something I wanted to bring up too, which is, and this is what Najah touches on in her report, which is really the importance of teachers. So let me find this question. So I read it out. Um, okay, so this is from Neil Patrick. Like judicial reform, doesn't education reform in Saudi Arabia partly depend on changes in key personnel on the ground and ensuring they have a wide basis of training in order to apply new teaching methods, new curricula, and new teaching materials? In turn, what is the basis for monitoring in a fully transparent way whether the education changes are affecting actual teaching practices in the classroom? So asking about the education ministry's role in this. So maybe Najah and, and Fahad, you might like to talk about this one. Yes, of course. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so I think the Ministry of Education had some um, departments to um, evaluate and assess all the programs that have been taken over the few years. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the education reform is, is a long-term process. And even the Ministry of Education is not expecting you know, to know how successful these programs have been in a short time. So, but as long as, as the ministry has some departments um, to evaluate and assess all these programs and their, you know, short-term achievements, I think that is, you know, the right thing um, to do. But it's, it's early to um, know whether these programs actually are working or not, because this is a long-term um, process. Fahad, did you want to address this one too? Right. I mean, as I said at the outset, the uh, training of uh, teachers is absolutely a critical component of the broader education reform effort. Uh, we have long known this, and that's why we have invested uh, uh, quite a bit uh, into training, not just inside the kingdom, but like I said, we have spent, we have sent hundreds of teachers to 
uh, various countries around the world that have a bit more experience uh, in this sector than, than uh, we do in the kingdom and countries and institutions that have a record of success um, evidenced by, by uh, scores of not just evaluating teachers, but also the, obviously ultimately what you look at the ultimate metric is how your students perform. So we are, this is an ongoing uh, process. We absolutely believe that uh, the, the teachers are kind of a key to the success of this. And, uh, you know, just going back to, you know, one of the points that Farah raised, um, we also, I think, long acknowledge that in the past, we did have some uh, elements in our educational and religious institutions that uh, did espouse extremist views. We have gone out of our way to make sure that they are no longer in our institutions. We have suspended or expelled thousands of both teachers and uh, imams. We have trained, as I said, hundreds of others. We are doing everything we can uh, to make sure that uh, extremists of any sort uh, have no room to, uh, to maneuver or to succeed. In many ways, I think that Saudi Arabia views itself as a, as a leader of the international community's effort to counter extremists uh, of all sorts, but certainly extremists uh, you know, in, in our region. So we have done everything we can. We are using every tool at, at our, disposable, uh, our disposal to counter the mindset, the men, and the money that allow extremist organizations to, uh, to thrive and to uh, threaten the security of uh, countries around the world. And Fahad, is there a, a monitoring and an evaluation system that's been implemented or will be implemented to assess teacher competency and some of these other elements? Right, absolutely. So the ministry is, uh, does have ongoing uh, uh, programs that evaluate the performance of uh, teachers, but not only that, we have also provided mechanisms for parents to provide feedback uh, for students as well. So we believe, again, not only have we approached this in a kind of a multi-pronged uh, approach, but we believe that uh, for education reform to succeed, we do need input from various uh, sectors, not just obviously teachers, uh, not teacher, teachers, administrators, but the parents play a critical component. And as I said, we do want to, we have partnered with our, uh, outside partners uh, in the United States, the UK, Europe, and elsewhere to learn some, from some of the successes we've had. We realize this is a long-term project. As I said at the outset, this is an ongoing project that we will never really be satisfied unless every single student is a straight A student. And, and obviously that situation doesn't exist anywhere. Uh, but I, I think it's also instructive to note that uh, not only is education reform an ongoing process in the kingdom, it's an ongoing process everywhere else. So again, outside the United States, as an example, there's the debate over education and the efficiency and the effectiveness of education here in the United States. I, I think from what I can tell is still ongoing. So you have people, for instance, who uh, believe that have questions about the Department of Education as an institution and believe that the states should lead the education effort. I happen to live in, in the state of Maryland and I know that some of the public schools have changed their curriculum almost entirely two years ago and that has also been the subject of, of debate here uh, locally. So it's an ongoing process, uh, but we are doing everything we can. We're fully committed to making sure that our students have every tool at their disposal to succeed. It's definitely a process here too. And like Farah said from the outset, that it's definitely a national project for, for every country, for, for sure. So Farah, let me actually bring you back into this too, because something Fahad said, I wanted to ask you about this. So are there models from other predominantly Muslim countries that are useful to study or look at in terms of religious education reform or religious, or religious reform in general that you think might be useful um, and lessons could be drawn to the case and applied to the case of Saudi Arabia? Well, I think it's important to, to take a step back from some of what we've talked about and just ask ourselves, what is the point of education? What are we trying to do to these young people who are learning? We're trying to get them to be more um, analytic in, in the way in which they address problems, um, problem solving as they see things, so that they aren't believing everything that they see. Um, we have serious problems with technology and the way in which it's changing a child's brain and how they think um, and what they're able to do. There are multi-layered aspects to education that we were not confronting 20 years ago. So of course, the whole world is reviewing and reassessing 
how we teach, what we teach, um, the role of technology, the impact of um, uh, uh, certainly of um, historic ideas around what makes a well-rounded student. I'm going to push back on my friend Fahad and say that I don't think every kid, kid should need, needs to be a straight A student. That to me is not a sign of, of success. Um, there are more there are more aspects to this than we've talked about. But um, in terms of religious education, the aspect that you're talking about, Stephanie, that is important is, um, you know, no one is suggesting that you take religion off the education boards, many countries. I remember when I was doing my work um, in Europe, engaging with Muslims there, you know what country understood the most um, about why Muslim parents wanted to teach their children about Islam and felt like they didn't have what they needed to be able to do it because they were living as minorities? Which country in Europe? It was Ireland. It was Ireland because faith was important to them and they understood that they wanted, that a parent wants to teach their child to be faithful and to, to learn about the aspects of religion. So when we think about what countries are doing it right, the problem has been um, you know, a rush to just get something out there that sort of gets the facts on the table as, as quickly as possible. And there hasn't been a deep reflection on these other aspects about um, analytical response around um, you know, all of the societal things that go into religion as well. There hasn't been a marriage of this. It's been a very quick, how fast can we teach a child the basics of religion rather than the intent behind the words. Uh, there was something in Naja's uh, uh, report that she talked about a change in the curriculum to add some history, you know, what, but, and that intention part has been very shallow around the world. Have I seen a country that is teaching Islam in the perfect way? No, I haven't. But I have seen places that are better at saying, we've got, all got to live together. Here's what Islam says, but let's also teach you about what Hinduism says and Buddhism and Islam and uh, Christianity and Judaism so that you are living as a Muslim surrounded by other faiths and giving them dignity too. Um, and, and I think that is, is really important. The other thing I, I do want to say about um, the training of imams is that many countries have failed in their ability to, to do this well, Stephanie, because they've relied on others to bring imams to their shores to teach them, to teach the kids about Islam. And so what happens when you bring an outsider in is that that outsider doesn't understand the cultural context and the heritage and the history of the place, whether that is the Maldives or it is um, Denmark. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You want to have people teaching who understand the cultural context. And so the places that are thriving in terms of teaching religion and specifically Islam are those that have, um, have done a very good job of translating the Quran, um, the, the, the Quran in a way that has the history. So what version of the Quran are they teaching? Um, and, and I'm sorry to go back to this, but we are talking about this. The flooding of the marketplace on Saudi um, interpreted Qurans has been a real problem in the past because those Qurans have been all over the world and they have a very different dimension in terms of translation than some of the standard stuff out there. So we are looking at countries that have taken the time to understand which versions of the Quran their kids are, are learning, what's in, actually in the textbook, what is behind the intent of the words so that you're teaching the children more broadly? And where are the people who are teaching religion getting trained? And are these people um, authentic to the place? Um, those are aspects that are part of the toolkit that shows success. When you see countries that have gone bad in terms of and religion has often been, been, been relied on external, external sources, sources to teach their kids their kid how to do things to as do opposed things to taking the ownership the themselves. Let me now take a couple questions from the audience and I'm going to ask one as well because they're sort of all related. So we have a question from Ayad al Rifai, who is basically asking about generational differences. So in other words, some teachers, whether at university or in schools, 
that might be older, might have been trained in different ways, might have different attitudes versus younger teachers. So how to, how to deal with that issue, that's one question. And then another question from Halma is, how are religious, how are key religious figures in the kingdom looking at the education reform that's happening? And what is people's attitude in general? And then my question related to these is in Najah's report, she mentions that there has been a deliberate lack of transparent discussion about what's happening with the education reform. And she argues that that actually helps it appeal broadly to conservatives and liberals alike. So my question is, is the Saudi government planning to launch a more public discussion or campaign around this effort? So Najah, her friend, would you like yeah. to? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, the Saudi government are aware of um, how Islam is basically shaping the identity of the Saudis. Uh, it's part of their cultural legacy for a long time. It's also um, shaping their, their politics. It is an important um, co component um, to Saudis. And many, many Saudis, some, especially the conservatives, will always see that you know, any radical change in the education reform, um, in the education system, especially uh, the rule of religion, would be something like an attack on their identity. So I think the Saudi government is understanding, you know, these um, ideas and they prefer to have a, a gradual um, and, and be cautious about implementing these changes especially while they're also implementing an important change socially with um, women driving and um, introducing music and cinemas, things that have been always taboos, which have left many people who are like, especially the conservatives and the traditional traditionalists, they left many of them thinking that this reform is in favor of the liberal. So I think it is smart move to implement all these changes in a in a gradual and slow manner, instead of of implementing a, a radical and fast change that will upset some people in the society. Because you know we have liberal section, we have also conservative section. Uh, did you want to answer any of those? Right, so I think it's worth uh, mentioning uh, a couple of years ago, His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman spoke at the Future Investment Forum and he was asked about some of the reform efforts uh, in the kingdom. And he said that we do not have time to waste. We've wasted uh, many years uh, trying to tackle this issue, uh, the issue of extremism, but it is time that we uh, solve it and end it once and for all because of the fact that we do have a predominantly young population. It is a population that is becoming increasingly uh, better educated. It is well connected to the rest of the world. And we, uh, as uh, was underscored in uh, Najaf's report, we obviously, His Royal Highness also unveiled Vision 2030 in 2016. And one of the keys to the success of the vision is, is education. We fully believe that uh, technology and science, innovative thinking hold the key to, uh, to unlocking the potential of our Saudi youth, and it is the key to transforming our uh, uh, economy. So we, frankly, we don't have, there's no room, we've adopted a zero tolerance policy when it comes to extremism. So if you're an extremist of any sort, you will not have a role to play, certainly not in our educational institutions, not in our religious institutions. And certainly if you go further than that, you will be held uh, to account for, for any violent actions that you will, that you engage in. So um, we are fully committed to this and we work very closely with our partners uh, in the United States and other countries on, again, uh, promoting interfaith dialogue, on working together very closely on countering the activities, the narratives uh, of extremist groups uh, around the world. Um, and this will continue because I think it is uh, a key, certainly to the success of Vision 2030. But ultimately, as I think we've all unfortunately found out the hard way, uh, extremism is a, a global challenge. We have all uh, faced it in one way or another, regardless of what the, the uh, 
ideology is. And so it's a global challenge and it absolutely needs a global solution. And that global solution can only be achieved through cooperation uh, between various countries. And uh, we believe that the kingdom is at the forefront of this effort. Okay, I'm gonna take one more audience question before I give you each a chance to say a final closing word. So there's been a couple questions in the Q&A about the importance of critical thinking in the education curriculum. So can we address that point a bit about what changes are being made to specifically enhance critical thinking capabilities of young people, which we know is critical for the modern economy? Nijah, would you like to take that? Okay. Well, um, I think we have seen uh, in the last few years that um, Saudi Arabia wanted to adapt its education system with the economic growth. Uh, therefore, you know, we have seen, you know, um, amendment of content of religious textbooks in order to decrease uh, the, um, the, the religious, uh, the emphasis on religious teaching and put more emphasis on, you know, secular and, and liberal modules. Uh, so like you've mentioned next year, Saudi students will be able to um, study philosophy and critical thinking, which used to be banned when I was you know, living there. Uh, this is very important because we used to, uh, you know, the, the way we used to study is through rote memorization. Uh, we will also see um, foreign languages uh, being introduced, uh, such as Chinese language, and that's because the government wants to see the population uh, qualified and able to work in a globalized economy. So, and also um, an important movement actually, um, Last year, the uh, Ministry of Culture, they have introduced the first uh, ever scholarship in cinematic industry, music and art, which I think very important for uh, Saudi Arabia to achieve its uh, um, vision 2030 um, ambition to diversify the economy. We have seen how important the tourism and entertainment sector now uh, that needs Saudis to be qualified enough to run that business and to support the economy for for the future. So um, I think you know we see that you know the education system is now is harnessed with the national growth, with change in society, with uh, um, so and we will see that you know that will allow um, education to uh, support the economic plans uh, and the plans for the future. Okay, and now let's just have a closing word from each of you. So we'll start with Fahad and then we'll go to Farah and then we'll end with you, Nijah. So Fahad, please go ahead and, and give us a final thought. You're muted. Oh, Fahad, we can't hear you, you're muted. My apologies for that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so, so I do want to thank you for including me in this uh, conversation, uh, Stephanie, and I want to thank the Atlantic Council and the King Faisal Center as well. So I think it's important to stress that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is reforming its educational institutions, not because of some you know, perceived outside pressure or scrutiny, but because we believe that the, a good education is the bedrock of a strong economy and a vibrant society. So a solid education sector is both a goal and uh, it's, a, it's a goal as well as uh, a part of the uh, of Vision 2030, and it is a, one of the keys to its success. Uh, as I said at the outset, the vision was announced in 2016. It is transforming the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in many ways. It is not just transforming the economy, but it really, I think, in many ways brings a, a new way of thinking about uh, the possibilities that we have in the kingdom. We strongly believe that our strongest asset is our youthful, is our youthful uh, uh, population. We believe that they have unbound potential. We are trying to do everything we can uh, to give them the tools to uh, succeed. We uh, also, the vision ultimately, uh, one of its objectives is to, uh, to create uh, many jobs. And we do have a lot of jobs, technical jobs in the information technology, healthcare, the financial sector, 
uh, as well as in tourism, entertaining hus entertainment, hospitalities. These are all sectors that have been essentially built from the ground up. And we firmly believe that uh, for all of these sectors to, uh, to thrive, we need a robust and effective uh, education sector. I think we are well on, on our way. I think we're beginning to see a lot of the, the scores uh, go up on uh, various uh, uh, metrics for both students as well as uh, teachers. And uh, we fully intend to, to continue this process working closely with, uh, with other institutions as well as partners around the world. Because as I said, by definition, education reform is uh, an ongoing process. It's almost a never ending process because you can always do better. And let's uh, have a word from Farah now. Well, so I would say a couple of things. First is, um, you know, I, I, I recognize um, that education reform takes a while. Um, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the United States, we're a big country, um, it's complicated. Saudi Arabia is not as big and not as cumbersome as some of the other countries in the world. And what I hear from the leadership in Saudi Arabia and certainly in the 2030 vision is this desire for, as Fahad said, they are doing it in for internal reasons, not for external reasons. However, um, I would urge them to go fast and be creative and show, the, show us what is possible. They are, they are doing a spectacular job around COVID right now because they made it a priority. They um, implemented protocols and changes and shifts that you might've thought were not possible a couple of years ago in terms of human behavior, but they've been able to show us in a very short period of time that they can get their society to do things differently. And so I don't buy the argument that it is going to take some time. It's all very difficult. It isn't for a country that is small, that, is, um, that has a government the way they do and has the money that they do. Uh, I would urge them to really rethink the speed with which they are um, executing change. And I would say the second thing is, you cannot have others take you seriously on education reform if you do not respect um, the difficulties that other countries have had around the way Saudis have promoted uh, Wahhabism around the world. And I would urge them to think very short, uh, sharply about what they can do immediately to send a signal that they care as much about the global population of young people as they do about their own. Because identity and belonging is central to um, security and vibrancy for the, for the young people of our planet. And so one of the ideas that I put forward in my book, How We Win, uh, is that Saudi Arabia do a buyback program for their textbooks uh, uh, and Qurans around the world if they are serious about, about reform. And, and that's one idea I'm gonna put out for us today um, as I close. And I would like to thank the King Faisal Center and the Atlantic Council for including me in this lovely panel. Thank you, Farah. And Najah, let's close with you then. Uh, thank you so much. Um, from a perspective of somebody who lived in Saudi Arabia and, you know, between two uh, eras, um, I think Saudi Arabia finally is realizing the, their educational uh, shortcomings and they are actually doing a fantastic job in my eyes, uh, which is very, very fast. And um, I think, uh, you know, what matters is what Saudis see their education system and um, um, yeah, that what, what really, really matters actually. So, and thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me to speak about this uh, topic. Wonderful, thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.